everybody. Um, I hope everyone's doing well today on this slightly overcast and hopefully a little bit of rain later because we really need the rain um, Wednesday. This is the very last of our Nature Connections Lunch and Learn series. Um, it's been really great to sort of explore all of these different sort of citizen science and community science projects. Um, and I hope everyone's been inspired to do some fun things in their backyards and in their neighborhoods. Um, I will tell you, uh, if you were, um, if you attended our stream monitoring one a couple of weeks ago, and we actually had our training this past Saturday, we now have um, about 10 volunteers who are going to be doing stream monitoring on our property starting in June. So we're really excited about that. We had a fabulous day on Saturday learning about macroinvertebrates and identifying things and learning about the chemical testing. So, um, so we're very excited to be moving all of this forward. Um, today's project um, is super exciting. Um, Heidi Scheiber is going to do a great program for us all about fireflies and firefly watch because it's, it's beginning to be that time of year. So, you know, hopefully everyone will get outside in the evening as it's getting dark um, and marvel at the fireflies. We get a lot of them at my house and we absolutely love watching them. My daughter loves to go out and catch them and then watch them fly away. It's, they're just a super cool um, animal and I'm excited to learn a little bit more about them as well. So, um, so as, as I said, this is our last one for, for this series. We are going to take off this summer um, for the Lunch and Learns, but hopefully in the fall, if people are still interested, we will um, start them up again. So I'm going to turn it over to Heidi. Um, thank you all very, very much and take it away. Okay, great. So let me go ahead and share my screen. I'll get my presentation up. Let's see. Here we go. Hi everybody, it's so nice to have you here. Here's my presentation. Let me just go ahead and get it started. So glad that you could join us today. Um, so again, my name is Heidi Shiver, um, a, a volunteer at Bucks Audubon. I participate in the Community Science as well as Advocacy Committee. Um, I was the past president there and a board member and super excited that all of you are here today. Delighted to talk to you about fireflies. Can everyone see my screen? Is everybody there? It looks great, Heidi. Yep. Okay. Okay, yes. yes, it's there. Okay, thank you guys. So I just it was kind of weird. I went just disappeared. So here we go. All right, so let me get started. So this is what to expect today. Um, we're going to be doing an overview, talk about the biology, um, like their characteristics, what kind of foods they eat and so on, um, how their populations are doing. And then of course, talk about the wonderful Firefly Watch program um, through Mass Audubon. Oops, let's see. So an overview. Um, so how did we come to do um, the Firefly Watch program? So actually part of um, the community science um, community, um, community Science Committee, there's a subcommittee called the Pollinator Monitoring Subcommittee. And a few of us have been working on that. We started this last year. Last year, we did the Great Sunflower Project, which was super fun, focusing on native bees and their populations. But we really weren't happy with how the data was um, compiled. We really didn't have access to it. So we um, did some more thinking. And this year, we uh, have decided to focus on two programs, the Monarch Watch and Way Station program, which we, um, Sally talked about earlier in the Lunch and Learn series. And then this one, the Firefly Watch. And the reason we chose these is that they're data-driven, they have great research, and there's a huge need to gather this information. So that's why we're doing the Firefly Watch. Um, and I mean, can't wait to talk to you more about that. So um, as far as fireflies, Stacy was mentioning, you know, fireflies are um, very much loved by everyone. Um, there's something that we really all enjoy seeing in the summer and early spring. And the larvae right now are just slowly emerging. They're coming out and they're becoming adults. Um, they were in hibernation all winter and they're maturing and now into adults and getting ready to do some mating. So let me tell you a little bit more about them. So these are the common fireflies of, of the United States. The Lampridia family is a beetle family and we have um, so three of these. These are three genera groups that are distinguished, distinguished by a few different things that we'll talk about. Um, in North America we have 150 different species of fireflies and 16 genera and these are the th uh, main groups. So, so we have phot um, Photinus, Pyractomina and Photurus. And um, so Photinus, which is an interesting word because I thought you would become, you know, say it Photinus, or, um, but it's actually Photinus. And the reason why is it means that they're kind of tiny. So they tend to be small, they're only about a half an inch in length or even less. And they produce a yellow green flash that can be active both at dusk and at night. And they're the most studied of all the different um, fireflies. The pyroctomina um, can be distinguished by their raised ridge here that runs down the middle of their pronotum or their head shield. They're about the same size as the photinus, but their flashes are amber instead of green, and they're mainly active at night. And also they have like this black edge around their head shield here. 
Then we have Photurus. Photurus are very large. Um, they're up to an inch long. They're active and have long, slender legs. They look hunched around their shoulders and often have a light stripe running down their um, elytra, or elytra, which is their wing covers here. And the flashes of the Photurus species are noticeably greener and brighter compared to those of the Photinus or Photinus. So here in Pennsylvania, we have 15 different species of, um, of fireflies. I just want to talk about a couple specifically. So we have Photurus pennsylvanica, which is so exciting. We have our own um, firefly here. So this, uh, this is a really cool story about this. It began when some elementary students in Upper um, Darby saw an article about Maryland adopting an insect, a state insect. And Pennsylvania at, the time, at that time did not have a state insect. So they entered a selection of an insect symbol to the General Assembly. And then on April 10th, 1974, the firefly was formally adopted by the Pennsylvania General Assembly. So super exciting. And um, the, the, the governor um, came to the school and actually um, presented them with a bronze, plant, plat, um, a bronze plaque of the shape of a keystone, which still hangs in their school today at Highland Park Elementary School. So very interesting about having that special firefly as our state symbol or state insect. Then we also have the Photinus carolinius, which is also super exciting. And this is just something that was recently discovered. Another great story. So in 2011, a group of campers saw some fireflies flashing in unison at their campsite in Allegheny National Forest. They didn't really understand what was going on. So they contacted a firefly research group called the Firefly International Research and Education Team. And in June 2012, the year later, the team came out for 10, night, 10 nights and they observed what they were seeing. They were able to identify that there are 15 species of fireflies, including this special um, synchronized firefly. In 2013, um, the local residents of that area came to create the PA Firefly Festival. Um, and they you know, it got a lot of attention. Tons of people started coming, which is good and bad, right? Um, so people were super excited about what they were seeing, but also was then damaging the habitat that the fireflies were living in and it was actually hurting the fireflies. So they came up with some great protocols to help um, protect them. They also um, invited the world-renowned firefly research, Sarah Lewis. Um, she's a professor from Tufts University and she also is the author of Silent Sparks, a really famous book about fireflies, which I'll be talking a little bit more about later. But um, she also talked about the double-edged sword of firefly tourism. I was very impressed with the protocols that the um, folks had put in place for this festival. So with more thought and care, um, they've kind of changed the festival up a little bit. Instead of it only being one, um, one night a year, it's now two. Um, it's limited registration. They also have some unique campouts called Glow and No campouts that are located outside of the Forest County. And if you get to go, um, you can expect um, entertainment, expert information. You learn about how to handle fireflies and what's appropriate, and then you also get small groups. So this year, the festival is going to be June 25th and 26th in Kellettville. Sadly, though, it's already sold out. Um, but there, last time I was on the website, I did notice that there was a couple campouts still available. <clears throat> so anyway, I would love to do this. I hope maybe next year <clears throat> to attend the festival. Looks like a lot of fun. So anyway, it's very exciting that we had this particular um, firefly that synchronizes and they flash in unison together. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that might be. Okay, so more about the biology, about where they're found, where they eat, and so on. So their range. Fireflies are found in temperate and tropical regions on every continent except Antarctica. There are 2,200 species globally. And here in the United States, they live in parks, meadows, gardens, and woodland edges, places that are usually moist and usually where two habitats intersect. Um, they are not past really the, uh, the Rocky Mountains, and no one really knows um, really why um, that's still being re researched. And the best time to see them is at dusk and into the evening. Fireflies are not a fly, but a beetle. Um, they're an insect, and like insects, they have three parts. <clears throat> they have a head, thorax, and abdomen. Their head is usually covered or shielded. On the thorax, they have their six jointed legs. And then the abdomen has two wings, um, wing covers. Um, there's a wing cover that's dark brown and, and edged in yellow, and then there's another set of wings underneath there as well. These wings, these wing covers, aren't what fly, what, um, what they fly with. It's actually the wings tucked underneath them. And then importantly with this is they have segments at the very bottom, and that's where you have the lighting up and the little lanterns that we see them, that they flash. Let's see. They also have bilateral symmetry, and they have an exoskeleton, of course, like all insects for most. The head shield, so this is the Photinus and the Peractomina. The Photinus has a flatter grooved head, 
and the um, pyrobac pyroactamina has a raised ridge here, which is here. And it would be really hard to see them like over on a little grass somewhere in the dusk. You would actually have to take a hand lens to actually see the differences for these different um, species or genera actually. Shape and length. Leg length, the Photinus has much shorter legs, as you can see here, <clears throat> has darker wing covers. The Photurus has long, long leggy legs, and they have <clears throat> different shoulders. So the Photinus has a sharp crease here, and the Photurus has a smooth curve here. Again, something you'd have to see with the hand lens. What do they eat? So their diet depends on where it, um, they are in their life cycle. Life cycle. As a newly emerging larvae in the spring, most fireflies are feeding on other insects, including snails and worms. And they actually inject them with a numbing chemical to disable them. Then they inject them with another thing that actually makes them just dis disintegrate so they can just slurp them up, which I had no idea they were doing this. It's very cool. As adults, their diet varies from species to species. Some are predatory, predatory while others feed on plant, plant pollen or nectar or nothing at all. And this is actually when you know, um, they are actually the pollinators because they actually are getting in there in the pollen and the nectar and helping move um, nectar around and so on and pollen around. Not really efficient pollinators, but they are pollinators. So photinus, um, these are firefly, um, fireflies can be male or female. And this is what they look like when they're actually mating. Um, it can take up to 12 hours to mate. And the reason why is because the male is giving the female a nuptial gift, a nuptial gift. And that means that he's actually transferring to her some protein, which makes her to have more viable, um, stronger eggs and healthier eggs, which is very interesting. Um, males. Let's see what else I can say. Um, males also have a slightly larger organ. So this is the male here. This is the female. So she's larger than he is here. Um, what else do I want to say about this? And earlier in the season, there's usually 50 times more males than females at the beginning of the season for fireflies. And then that eventually changes over time. They're, they're more equal. So the females can be quite picky in the beginning. This is another just view they can see more clearly. This is the male here with the two segments that are fully um, used as a lantern. The female only has a small part here, which makes them a little bit more easily identified if you're out in the field. So again, probably hand lenses are the best for seeing these differences. So how and why do they glow? So fireflies produce their glow through the chemical reaction of luciferin, luciferase, ATP, actually calcium and oxygen in a process known as bioluminescence. The insects rely on these flashes to do for a number of things. First, to attract mates, also to defend their territory, and to also to alert um, potential predators that they have a foul taste. So fireflies are poisonous, and that's important to know, and that's why you want to wash your hands after you touch them. Also, flash patterns are going to vary between species. Um, they're usually only active about 45 minutes a night. Um, the female responds only when she wants to because there's more males than females usually, and she can identify um, who she wants to hang out with by their flash. Um, if he, how she chooses, I guess she fly, if the male flashes, then she flashes back. And if she likes the way he's flashing, then she'll flash back and encourage him to come visit her. Um, flashing is the language of love for the fireflies, and that's how they communicate. Um, let's see, also flashing varies depending on temperature. You know, they are insects, they are cold blooded. So when it's colder outside, they're going to flash a little slower. As it heats up, they flash faster, which I didn't know that. I thought that was very interesting. I love this infographic, I just had to include it, that nearly 100% of the flash's energy is light, whereas a light bulb is only 10%. So it's very efficient, it's the most efficient light that's created, and it doesn't generate any heat. Um, the light emitting organ consists of three parts. It includes a reflector, light cells, and a transparent exoskeleton, and this is what it looks like here. <clears throat> Also, I like this infographic because it does show some interesting flash patterns, and we'll talk a little bit more about them as I go on. But I just like the way it looked here, but this is the um, um, Photinus paralis. I think it's like the Big Dipper, and he makes a J. This is the most common um, firefly in the North America that you'll be most likely to see as well. Okay, so after they mate, after they hook up, what happens next? So after a few days of mating, a female lays her fertilized eggs on or just below the surface of the ground. The eggs will hatch in three to four weeks, and the larvae will feed until the end of summer. Fireflies do hibernate over winter during the larval stage. Some do this by burrowing under the ground, while others will just tuck under the bark of a tree. Um, the larvae then emerge from a hibernation in the spring, just like they're doing this very moment here in Pennsylvania. And then after several weeks of feeding, they'll pupate for one to two and a half weeks and emerge as adults. So we're just any moment now, we're going to be having some fireflies here in Pennsylvania. Um, glowworm time. So fireflies spend most of their time in the larvae stage as a glowworm. They can live to one to three years this way, and they also glow. Their little eggs also glow. So the stages, um, the life cycle um, 
life cycle of the firefly is four stages. It's an egg, then the larvae, then a pupae, and then an adult. So I have some more fun facts for you guys. Um, they have synchronized flashing, which is a very cool. Let's see, I've written something about this up here. Let me just take a look. Um, so they flash in unison together. The reason why they do this is um, it helps um, amplify um, their signal. So if there's anything else going on around it, they believe that the synchronized flashing helps them focus, um, helps the females focus on the males. And that's very interesting. This is not uncommon. This is just in other places as well, in other types of animals as well as, as you know, the, um, synchronized flashing. So this is one really cool thing that they do. They also have different names, as you guys know. So we have um, folks that use the word lightning bug, other folks use fireflies. And this is also a very cool story about this. Um, uh, let me tell you the story first. Um, so back in 1949, the linguist Hans Kurath found that firefly was particularly popular, popular in large cities on the East Coast. Then later in the Dictionary of American Regional English, it found that lightning bug was the most common term used in the South and the Midwest, but not on the Pacific Coast. And New York City seems to be caught in the middle. According to um, this report, 86% <clears throat> of Manhattan residents use the term firefly and 60% of people on Staten Island use the um, term lightning bug. So I just thought that was very interesting um, how that, where that lies. You know, I do hear people using different terms. And then I found these also, these are also common regional names, including firefly beetle, glowfly, moon bug, golden sparkler, fire devil, big dipper, and blinky. So I can't really see you guys for the chat, but Stacy, is any, maybe you guys can let me know um, how many of you use the term lightning bug? Maybe you can um, put in the chat how many folks are using the word. So you use the word lightning bug, Jim? Um, how about firefly? Anybody using firefly? I can't I use tell. both. You use both? Mm -hmm. Any other responses? All right, let's move on. I just thought that was interesting. Um, applications and research. So chemicals from fireflies are used in medicine and research to study changes brought to cells by disease, ranging from cancer to muscular dystrophy. They can also be used to detect food spoilage and bacterial contamination. And they are also used in spacecraft instruments designed to detect life beyond Earth. And another great story, in 1940, a biochemist named William McElroy, um, back, he, um, he began his work using luciferous products to, for um, creating ATP assays. And he really needed a lot of material, a lot of luciferous. So he went to the local children to collect fireflies. And he did this by posting an ad in the newspaper. And so um, kids, if they um, collected 100 fireflies, they would get 25 cents. So in the very first year, they actually um, collected 40,000 fireflies, the kids did. Then in 1960, over 500,000 to a million were collected. So just um, 10, years, um, 10 years later, so that's really crazy. Um, I think everyone's not muted if someone can mute themselves. I can hear the phone ringing. Anyway, so this can continue to be a problem um, for you know, something that people what were doing to collect fireflies. And this was a, an ad actually um, from the Sigma Firefly Scientist Club. Um, this is in Missouri and in the 1960s, they created this club to create a vast network of firefly collectors who harvested millions nationwide. And they offered instead of 25 cents, 50 cents for every hundred. So many church scouting and 4-H groups um, were participating. And this went on until 1993 until Sarah Lewis, this famous researcher for fireflies, wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal, bringing this to light and find there was some pressure to stop doing this. Um, and it's not like this material wasn't available. So in 1978, scientists were able to actually manufacture luciferous in the laboratory without harming any fireflies. And that material has been readily available since 1985. And despite all this, there still is a small company in Tennessee who's still harvesting fireflies right now. They're harvesting over 40,000 a year. So anyway, just thought this was very interesting what's going on behind the scenes. Okay, another interesting fact is that they're predators, like I mentioned before. They're primarily carnivorous and will even eat other firefly species. And then there's mimicry, actually very aggressive mimicry. So it's very complicated out there. It's not just like these beautiful fireflies just flying around. There's a lot of um, intrigue going on. So sometimes and deliberately, a female signal will attract a different member of a different genus. And careless members from the um, genus Photinus, because they're little tiny ones, um, really suffer for this. So if a male responds and approaches, approaches a female from the Photurus, those larger fireflies, they're often killed and eaten by her. 
Okay, so what she does is she, um, the photurus can actually blink, uh, give different blinking patterns depending on what she wants. So she can use a different blinking pattern to lure a photinus to her instead of her own, her own um, genus, which is crazy. Um, and the reason she does this is that um, by eating him, she can handle the poison from him. She has a mutation within, um, has a mutation where she can handle the, the poison and actually uses that to her benefit. So she has this special steroid or poison in her system that allows her to become very um, unappetizing to jumping spiders. They probably love to attack fireflies. And um, once the fire, a jumping spider tries to eat her, they're like, oh, yuck, this is awful and stay away. Um, so anyway, this is a very interesting behavior that this is going on, that the photurus is deliberately giving a diff different signal to attract a different um, genera or gen genus so that she can um, benefit by having this extra poison to protect her from spiders. It also gives her a longer life, which means more opportunities to reproduce. So anyway, very interesting, right? A lot of intrigue out there going on. They're also an environmental indicator and they are in decline. And they're in decline um, because of lawn and agricultural chemicals, especially those weed and feed products that we all use. Um, sometimes um, the weed and feed have 2,4-D in them, which is very toxic to earthworms, beetles, and ladybugs. And being beetles, that's obviously very toxic to fireflies. Also light um, pollution is a big problem. It drowns out their luminescence, which is their mating signals and increases background, background noise for detecting courtship signals. And then habitat loss is another problem as well. And as you can see from this um, graph here, not the best one, but you can you know, basically say that this is back in the 1950s. There's very little light pollution here in the United States. And then here at the very bottom, this is where we're headed. A lot of light pollution makes it very challenging for fireflies to find a mate. Okay. So how are they actually doing? So um, an organization called the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, creates a red list of threatened species each year. And they recently did a study of fireflies. And this is what they found. This is the graph that shows what their findings were. So interestingly, most of the graph is 55% of it shows that they're data deficient. They really don't have much information about fireflies. Um, so they really need more surveys done, more po um, population monitoring and basic life history research. So that's why this firefly watch program is especially important for us to be involved in. The other ones, these are 33% um, are in least concern, which is a good sign that fireflies are, some of them are doing okay. Um, and they, you know, with that information, they want to continue to do some collaborating um, with conservation efforts and outreach and engagement strategies. But for the remaining 16%, these guys are not in good shape at all. These are um, critically endangered um, or vulnerable or nearly threatened. So I wanted to just focus on one particular firefly uh, over in Delaware. So the Center for Biological Diversity and Xerces Society, they actually filed an emergency petition recently seeking for the Endangered Species Act protection for a critically impale, um, imperiled Bethany Beach firefly. This is a very rare firefly that's been only documented seven times along the Delaware coast. And most of their um, habitat is only about the size of a fire, uh, a football field. So only seven football fields left of these little fireflies habitat. And the wetland area that is home to the uh, largest remaining population of this Bethany firefly is being developed. So it's really not a good story here. So if the US Fire um, Fish and Wildlife Service does grant them this emergency request, it would be the first time that an Endangered Species Act protection would be awarded to um, a firefly. So fingers crossed that they will be awarded this so that they can start making efforts to help protect them and their habitats. Okay, so that's the situation with fireflies. So these are things that you can do to help. Um, you can turn off your light outside at night and also encourage your neighbors to do that as well. Um, let logs and litter accumulate. The females like to um, lay their eggs in, in this kind of you know, environment. They like logs and litter. You wanna create some water features in your landscape. That can just include a bird bath even, that would be helpful. A pond would be even better. Um, avoid using pesticides, especially long chemicals, like I mentioned, the weed and feed. Use natural fertilizers like compost. Um, don't over mow your lawn. And if you do mow your lawn, keep it a little higher. You know, Don't make it really short, keep it a little higher so they have some space to get up onto the um, leaf um, blades so they can communicate with each other. other. Um, also plant native trees and um, plants. They especially like white pines. Um, they love to be in the white pines. They, they get high up in the tree so they can communicate as well. And then of course, participating in Firefly Watch. That's also a really good thing to do. And we're gonna talk more about how to do that. 
So this is the Firefly Watch Community Science Program. This program began in 2008 and attracts more than 1,000 people in 50 states, including Pennsylvania, and in all six Canadian provinces. So it's a really um, program, so it's doing really well. It hasn't been around that long. So if you um, type into, do a Google search on Firefly Watch, this is the page that will come up and it has lots and lots of information. A lot of, some of the information that I'm providing here on the slides here is actually from them directly. Um, here in the column here to the left, if you cl um, clicked, oh, sorry about that. Um, it has the, the Firefly Watch, it tells you how to um, participate, submit observations, gives you some answers to questions you might have, talks about the different researchers and so on. So how to join and participate? You first wanna identify a fly, firefly habitat to study. It can be your backyard. If you don't have a great backyard that would be good for fireflies, you can always come to Bucks Audubon. Bucks Audubon has beautiful meadows, great place to find fireflies. We have thousands of fireflies at Bucks Audubon. Um, then you wanna go and register online at the Firefly Watch website. And then you're gonna describe the habitat online. In your chosen habitat, you're gonna note the date, time, and weather data. And then for three to 10 second intervals, count the number of flashes seen. When you have all that information, then you go to the Firefly Watch um, program and put this in. And I'm gonna show you how to do this. So this is what it looks like. Let me get my little sheet out here so I can see it better. So basically it starts on the left. Um, you wanna put the date in first, and then here there's the habitat type. You can just click on one of these. It could be either open field, mowed lawn, wetlands, forest, pavement, or other. Then for habitat mowing, um, has it been mowed recently? You would either answer yes or no or not sure. Temperature, it's important to mention the temperature because that'll affect how quickly or slowly they're, they're um, flashing. Precipitation, is it foggy, light rain, heavy rain, or none at all? Wind, you'll mention it, the wind, cloud cover, and then artificial light source is important. That kind of goes up here to the second page up here. Um, that includes visible within the habitat, near the habitat, or visible but far from the habitat. So that's important to note as well. Then you want to include your observation start time. And then you're going to do these three 10 second observations. Um, so you don't really have to have any you know, super knowledge about all the things that I talked about today. It's just very basic things. You're going to be counting the number of flashing fireflies. So in the first 10 second period, how many fireflies did you see? Did you see none, one to five, six to 10, 11 to 25, or more than 25? Then you're going to do it a second time and then a third time doing a 10 second interval and, and jot all that information down here. Then the um, next question is number of flashing patterns. Different fireflies make different flash patterns. Approximately how many different flashing patterns did you see? So maybe none, hopefully some, one or two, more than two, we're not sure. Now, what was the most common flash pattern observed? Was it single, double, triple, other, or not known? And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that next so you know what that means. So this, the form is very simple to fill in. It's very easy, very quick, only takes a couple minutes to do this. And these are the flash patterns. Um, this is provided on their site as well. So here's the J guy that I mentioned before, but here's, this is with um, tech, 10 seconds at the top here. So the, the first couple are single patterns. So you have one in zero seconds, and then at five seconds, you have another flash. Here's another single flash, zero, and then three, and then six, and then 10. So there's this inter, you know, inter, inter, intermittent, um, that would be considered a single flash. And then a double flash is like, um, Every two seconds, you see a flash, and they're more closely um, together when they flash, especially as you see here with the photonus um, consaguine. Um, this is um, closer together. Oops, sorry. And then the very bottom, I can't quite see that because you guys are there. Um, this is, um, it's right, every single second you see a flash, and that would be considered a multiple, multiple flash. Does that make sense, I hope? Let me go to another one. Here's um, another um, chart as well. And these are also all found on the website as well. So if this is too much information for me, um, for me and too quickly, you can go onto the website and really carefully study this. But here's another chart that shows the male flash pattern and then the female response. So these are the singles up here. Um, here's a single male and here's a single female response. She has very minimal response <laughs> and a very short. And I guess the, the length of um, the little mark there just shows how long the light, um, how long the flash lasts. So this, the, um, this one here, the paralysis has a very long flash. And again, hers is kind of short. So these are all considered single. These are down here, the multiple ones. Okay. Okay, so also on this side, on their Firefly reports. Um, this is a really fun map to check out. There's a little toggle switch at the top. So I went to July 13, 2020 last year, and this is what you would have seen on the map. 
These are all the folks that are involved in the program, and this is the reports that they're providing it, showing um, where the density of fireflies are being seen at that point for the participants in the program. This is obviously, there's lots more fireflies going on, but these are the folks involved in the program. Then there's also firefly scene map. Um, so once you register in the program, you'll be one of these little blobs too. And you can click on them. And one, I, I clicked on location 1340, which is nearby. Um, this was on May 7th in 2020. And so according to the legend, there was two little fireflies would be equal six to 10 fireflies were seen um, in the average of three counts submitted during that observation period. So here's a little legend down here. One firefly means one to five fireflies were seen. Two firefly means six to 10. Three means 11 to 25 fireflies were seen. Then if you have four, it means then more than 25 fireflies were seen. So anyway, it's a lot of fun. It's a fun map to play with. You can see who, um, other folks that are involved in the program and it's a good, great way to get involved. All right, um, as far as catching fireflies, um, everyone loves catching fireflies. I sure did as a kid. Um, the best way to do that is um, first to avoid har harming the firefly, you wanna use a, a little net, like a very soft, fine mesh net if you can. Um, once you catch the firefly, then gently place it in the, in the jar and containing a, a moist paper towel for humidity. Make sure you put some holes in the top so they have some air coming in. Um, after, after you've got a really good look at them, you wanna make sure that you release the firefly where you found them and try to do like within an hour or so. You don't wanna keep them overnight, really. That's not really great for them. They have such a short time to mate. It's only one to two weeks they have to mate. So you wanna get them back out there in the game so they can find somebody. Um, so just take a moment to look at them. Um, if you handle the fireflies, make sure you don't have any insect repellent on your hands, of course, right? And then wash your hands afterwards um, when you're done because they are poisonous. Okay, um, and also don't use a, fl a flashlight when you're out there because that would be really confusing to them if you have a flashlight walking around with them. Um, they'll think you're another firefly. Um, as far as the information, um, if you would like to look and learn more, um, Silent Sparks is a wonderful book. Let's see where I put it. This is by Sarah Lewis. Um, we read this actually for the Nature Lovers Book Club, which is a book club for um, Audubon, for Bucks Audubon. And Sarah Lewis is actually one of the researchers um, that's involved with this program. She's at Tufts University and she's taking this information that we're providing um, and using that to learn more about the fireflies. So I really highly recommend this book. I just um, covered just a wee bit about what's in there. There's also lots of information about fireflies in Thailand and in Japan. Um, and then more information about um, fireflies here in North America. So it's a great book, I highly recommend it. Um, so I just wanna tell you more about our little subcommittee as well. Our pollinator subcommittee has a number of events this year. A couple have already passed. So March 31st was when Sally gave her um, Learn and Lunch series um, presentation on monarchs. Um, I'm doing mine today on the 26th. So these are the next things that are coming up. July 8th, we have a monarch migration trip virtual presentation. Barbara was really fortunate and she got to go to Mexico and see the monarchs actually hibernating down there. So she's gonna be telling us about her exciting trip. Then on July 12th, um, I'm sorry, July 22nd and 24th, at Bucks Audubon, we're doing a butter count, butterfly count virtual presentation and on-site count with Diane Smith, which is super exciting. Um, this is also very important data that's collected and um, sent to researchers, researchers as well. Then our culminating event is on July 31st at 4 p.m. We're actually having a, a movie showing, a virtual movie showing of a documentary called Beauty on the Wing. Um, we actually have the um, filmmaker um, present. She's a documentary filmmaker. She will be um, there explaining to us about her um, film and how she, it came to be, then showing it to us, and then afterwards um, doing a question and answer period. So super excited about that. Hope you can join us. Um, these are the references and resources that I use. There are actually many more. So if anyone has any specific questions, you know, be sure to reach out to me or Bucks Audubon. So thank you so much for my um, being here and listening to my presentation. I hope you'll consider joining our community science program or the other um, wonderful committees we have at Bucks Audubon. Also consider becoming a member of Bucks Audubon. And I'd love to have you at the Nature Lovers Book Club. We meet on the fourth Thursday of every month at 6.15. Um, obviously, with COVID, we've been meeting virtually, um, which has been lots of fun. We've actually had folks from California and Michigan joining in, so that's been a lot of fun. But I'm hoping probably this summer sometime we'll start meeting um, together again at the um, book, bookstore in Doylestown. So anyway, thank you again. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Let me get just escape here real quick, and I can see you all better. If you have any questions, just let me know. That was great, Heidi. Thank you. Thank um, you. Maybe you guys can drop uh, message questions in the chat or we're a small group. And if you just want to unmute and ask, um, you can do that as well.
lots and lots of great cool things. Aren't they amazing? They're so cool. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? Can you put a link to the Firefly website in chat? Okay, great. Thanks for doing that, Stacey. I appreciate that. No problem. Well, it's been wonderful doing this. So I'm glad to be a part of this. Thank you so much, um, Stacey, for hosting this and organizing this for the Lunch and Learn series. It's been a lot of fun being part of this. And there are just so many wonderful community science programs out there that people can be involved in. This is one of many. There's like 100, like mm -hmm. easily 100 programs. So I hope folks will get involved. Absolutely. Now that we, you know, Get out in your backyard and see what's there and you know and then share that share what you're learning it's amazing the amazing people you can find when you get involved with these community science projects as well Absolutely. people who you know are very interested in the same things you are so it's always fun that way definitely thank you heidi very much that was very interesting <laughs> oh thanks jim great to see you thanks for coming today i appreciate it oh sure and stacy thank you for the whole program it's just been wonderful you're right. oh you're very welcome it's been a lot of fun good Good. Yes. Alrighty. Um, ooh, let's see. Um, do animals use the light at night? Um, what do you mean by that? Use the light at night. They're using the well. They're using the light to communicate. They're communicating and also drawing a mate so they can mate. They only have two weeks to mate, so they're using their light for that purpose. If that's what you mean. Um, but they're one of the only animals that I can think of that use light at night besides maybe um, animals um, in the ocean. <sighs> That's the only other ones that I can think of that use bioluminescence. Anyone else know more? Maybe Diane knows more than I do about that. So yes, another animal, some other bioluminescence. Bioluminescence. Yes, yeah. bioluminescence. Yeah, there's there's a yeah, there's a lot more in uh, I think a lot more sea creatures uh, than mm. terrestrial. Right, that's that. Creature, absolutely. But um, there are. I was wondering. Yeah, go ahead. yeah, I was wondering, I'm a member of Mass Audubon and I just see okay. this, you know, the Firefly looks like they've got the, well, they have the spreadsheet or the, the worksheet. Do you, does Bucks do quite a bit with Mass Audubon? Uh, you know, that group in particular or no? Yeah, this, you is know, our, collaborative. this is my first experience working with Mass Audubon. Stacey, do you um, have any, any other knowledge of working with Mass Audubon? Um, I don't believe so. Um, there's so many different wonderful Audubon organizations everywhere. Um, we do work closely with our regional um, Audubon, um, which is Audubon Mid-Atlantic, um, as well as a lot of our other local chapters um, for, um, for both programming and a lot of our advocacy work um, we do in conjunction with, um, with the other Audubon groups. Um, but we, I don't think we've done a lot with Mass Audubon in the past. Um, but the, you know, Mass Audubon's done a great job Thanks. with this program. This is a fabulous program. Again, we chose it because it's research driven. Um, we realized that the information that's yeah. gathered is, is being used for a worthy purpose and some really outstanding researchers that are involved with this. I mean, Sarah Lewis is amazing with, with the work that she's done. So we're really excited to contribute and support and amplify this message. Great. All righty. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Um, for many of you who attended all of our Lunch and Learns, so thank you. Um, those thank of you, you. Who, are, who are new to this this week, we appreciate really good. it as well. Um, if you are looking, you know, if you're missing it over the summer, um, remember all of these are recorded um, and available on Bus Audubon's YouTube page, which you can access from our website. Um, and you can rewatch all of these or any that you missed. And um, and just learn something new every day. Um, thank you all. Don't forget the property looks beautiful right now. Come on out, take a walk, take a bird watch, um, whatever you feel like doing, um, but get outside and enjoy this beautiful weather. Um, thank you all so much. And I will hopefully see everyone soon. Thanks you guys. Take care. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye-bye.